Send him back to school and teach him what this game is about. That's right. Back to school now has an animation, so it's an official thing. And uh, our college coach of the day is former big leaguer and Harold Reynolds teammate Scott Bradley, who has been at Princeton for the better part of a two and a half decades. Terrific resume at the college level. Scott's had a ton of success there. He's built the Tigers program into being uh, one of the best in its conference. And in fact, Harold, the first off-season ballpark camp. Yeah, look this at this. Awesome. They, they have uh, hitting in the mornings. Uh, clearly with Princeton, you got to figure out when you can get in to before school and opportunities to get in there and look hit. At this big look at lad. this facility. This a college kid? It's a college kid. Scott's packing them in, man. Well, we'll ask the coach about it. He's a big man. Let's he welcome him. He was telling Scott. me yesterday about uh, this new pitching machine they have there at Princeton, too. Scott, welcome. Good to see you, man. Hey. Hey, thanks, Harold. Hey, Matt, how are you? We're great. Hey, tell us who that was we were watching swing the bat, and then I'm curious about this pitching machine that Harold just mentioned. Yeah, that was uh, Matt Scannell. Uh, Matt's uh, father uh, is the, Tim is the coach at Trinity, a uh, great Division three power in uh, in Texas. Um, Matt does a little of everything for us. He's uh, he's played first. He's played outfield. He's left-handed. Uh, he can actually, he actually played a couple innings at second base last year wow. and as a, lefty. Um, is, as a lefty and was like our third catcher, uh, and also jumps up on a mound and is 90 plus off the mound. So, Woo. uh, he, he's a pretty good talent for us. Wow. So, so Scott, obviously at Princeton and Ivy league school, uh, the biggest challenge is getting kids into school. So how, 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 how difficult is that? And how do you recruit? How do you find that top end kid? Well, I think for all the Ivy league schools, uh, we don't go watch players unless we feel like we have a legitimate chance to be able to uh, to get them in. Um, so we first look at the grades, look at the transcripts, and then we go out and watch them. And um, it's a tough process, but there's a lot of terrific student athletes around the country. Um, we get about 1,500 emails, uh, letters uh, a year from kids that are interested in our program, and then we're allowed to support six or seven applications through the admissions process each year. They still have to be Princeton caliber students. Um, our Dean of Admissions will go through and they want to make sure that the uh, that that our recruits are going to be able to handle the academic rigors of of what we have here at Princeton. Yeah, and I've known you long enough and I've, I've known several kids that have gone through your program uh, for parents that are sitting out there because so many kids now are looking for that high end school. It's not like the Ivy Leagues of, of old. It's like, hey, they're playing great baseball, but it's the education. Tell me about uh, the main camp that a lot of them go to and a lot of the coaches of the high ends, Ivy uh, the Leagues, the Duke, Stanford, go to to see where these kids are at at one time. You know what? We, uh, we go watch uh, the events where we know that there are kids interested in our program. Uh, we love – we run our own camps. We love when kids uh, – take the time to come to campus where we can really spend some time with them, uh, get to know them. They can kind of get to know the staff. A lot of times with our camps, we'll have our own players working. And um, it, 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 one of the best things when a kid's coming through uh, and comes to a camp, if he has a chance to interact with one of our players, it's one of the best marketing tools that we have. I would imagine there's an additional challenge there too, because I mean, just spitballing here, if you're the head coach at like Southwest Tech State, uh, and there are no academic standards, the likes of which you have at Princeton, you could get a couple of studs that aren't that smart. I mean, wouldn't you like to mix in a couple of a, a couple of non academicians that can just go out there and play for you? You know what? Uh, they still have to go to class. And uh, when we go on the bus, uh, I see some of the books uh, and, and some of the homework that our guys are doing. I went to the University of North Carolina, a terrific school. I felt like I, I got a great education. And I see some of the books and some of the work that our guys are doing on the bus, and it is way out of my league. Man, I, I tip my cap to student athletes because they're Harold and I. I'll speak for myself. Harold, Harold might have been able to do it. There is no <laughs> chance a it. dummy like me could have tackled playing collegiate athletics. First of all, I didn't have the talent, and then and, and then maintained an academic curriculum. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's not as easy as fans think. And when you watch Division One athletes, Division Two athletes. Noting that, that the sports is a side gig, they're students. Yeah, it's I mean, it's something that we all kind of lose perspective on, how difficult that is to pull off for these kids. It is. And our kids, uh, the thing that we try to stress more than anything else with our guys is, is balance. 
Uh, we want them to have balance in their lives. We want them to be able to develop um, in every aspect of things that they're interested in, um, both on the field, off the field, extracurriculars. Um, and, and that's what the Ivy League allows these kids. It is really the true um, student athlete experience well beyond what they have at the Power Five schools. You know, you see our guys working out over in our terrific indoor facility right now. We're sort of in our in our in our non-competitive uh, season, our non-fall season. So we're allowed four hours a week of of up to four hours a week of skill work, and we try to break our guys into small groups so that they can come down in and around their classes, get their work in, and then go back to campus and and take care of everything that they need to take. So it it really makes it so that baseball becomes a part of their college experience. Um, but by no means it is the it is it the only part of their college experience. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Hey, Scott, the other thing I was looking at that team picture there. There's a lot of colleges we could take that team picture of, and you won't see what you saw at Princeton. There's a lot of diversity. Having known you through the years, I see a couple uh, African American kids in there, and that that number, just two of them, would be bigger than most. But you have a lot of guys from all over the world, clearly from different being at Princeton from all over the, the globe. Uh, how important has that diversity piece been for your program? You know, Harold, thank you for, uh, for for noticing that. And you know what? It's something that we've always done, and it's something that I'm very proud of, is that we never really had to make it a focus. We've always had diversity uh, on our team. You know, going back to, you know, Will Venable, um, who now has joined Chris Young over in over in Texas, um, I think if you get out, I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of my professional contacts. Um, you know, a lot of uh, kids of former players. So we've had a chance to go to a lot of events where there is more diversity than others. And again, I'm very, very proud of uh, of our record when it comes to you know having having quite a bit of diversity on our on our ball club each and every year we love will he's a star he you, you he really man, is. you put a good one out there for sure he is a he's a star in the make hey we understand there is a harold reynolds princeton tigers connection here what is the story that i can't wait for you to tell i can't wait to hear it what we got well you know we all we all any of us that know harold and spend time with him, we know that he has a tendency to sort of downplay his relationships and his friendships you know, at one point, Harold told me that he was coming into New York to go to a basketball game to watch his Ducks. And I asked him what time his flight left. He goes, well, I'm on Phil Knight's plane, so we're going to go back whenever we uh, whenever we want to. So Harold, uh, I don't know, eight to ten years ago, Harold's been down to campus before. He's had his kids running around indoor facility. Harold calls me up. He goes, hey, I just found out one of my high school friends works at Princeton. I'd love to come on down to campus and, you know, let my kids run around and Maybe I'll have a chance to go see him as well. So the conversation ended quickly. I didn't have a chance to ask who it was. <laughs> so Harold uh, and and Kelly come to the game or come to the to the field. I meet him at the parking lot with the kids and they're running around and we do some things. And then Harold goes, "I need to go meet Chris. We have to go up to Nassau Hall to meet Chris." Well, Nassau Hall on at Princeton is like the White House. I said, "Chris." In Nassau Hall, I said, who are you talking about? He goes, well, I think he's got an important job, but his name's Chris Eisgruber. Chris Eisgruber is the president of the university, <laughs> uh, the, the most esteemed person that we have on, on campus. Harold went to high school with him. So we proceeded to go up to uh, basically the Oval Office up in, up in Nassau Hall. And uh, Harold's kids ran all over the place. Harold kept looking at me saying, I think they're going to break something any any second now. Uh, <laughs> and we just had a uh, just a great time. He was the captain of the chess uh, team at Corvallis High School. Wow, that's Chris awesome. Chris Eisgruber's a big, big Cubs fan. Cubs fan, uh, yeah. He and Harold are, you know, went to high school together, and we had a fun afternoon, Sa that's for sure. Saving a place in student housing for the Reynolds kids in a few years. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. That's correct. That'd be great. Hey, so uh, before we get to Bo Jackson, real quick, because I, I, I'm curious – on that, I want to take a second, but the World Cup, we're talking soccer real quick. We may not even get to Bo because I know we're running tight, but tell us about the Bradley family and soccer. Well, uh, you know, most people know uh, my brother Bob coached the U.S. national team in the South African World Cup. Uh, my nephew Michael was uh, played in two different World Cups, was uh, one of the main players. So the, the soccer uh, runs deep in our family. We're big fans. We're clearly rooting for, for U.S., 
to do what they can. But uh, with everything that my brother did and and my nephew Michael is continuing to do, my brother now coaches TFC and has a chance to coach Michael uh, once again. Um, so uh, proud of everything that they accomplished uh, being part. Michael scored a big goal in the World Cup in South Africa. And you think about, you know, being able to coach your kids in Little League or high school or whatever, but you know, being able to coach your own son in an event like the World Cup is really is really quite amazing. That's really pretty neat. cool. Pretty cool. So last week, Scott texted me and he's like, I'm tired of trending, man. On this play, we're trending on this Bo Jackson play. I was telling him we made Bo famous. Scott was the hitter. It's the 10th inning. But Scott, I don't think I've ever asked you, from your vantage point, what did you see on Bo's throw? Because clearly the broadcast doesn't carry it. Well, the funny thing is a lot of times like that clip right there, it doesn't even show me. It just sort of shows the ball going into the corner and running. Um, but I know you were running on the pitch. It was actually the bottom of the ninth. There was one out. You were running on the pitch. And as soon as I hit it, I knew the ball was was one hop, you know, off the wall in the corner. And I'm thinking the game's over. So I run to first. Uh, as I get up, I see Bo pick up the ball off the wall. I'm waiting for everybody to come out and congratulate me for a uh, for, for a walk off. <laughs> I see Bo just turn and throw the ball. I see you running and the ball keeps gaining, gaining ground on you. And everybody knows uh, you led the league in stolen bases. You could really run. And the funny part was Bob Boone literally had started to walk to the dugout thinking that the game was over. And he said, Oh, I better go back to the plate. And he walks back to the plate and literally catches the ball on top. Um, but as I told you earlier, if you were safe, nobody would talk about me anymore. I didn't do a whole lot in my major league career. And uh, to, to have this play come up every year so people remember that I actually did play in the major leagues. And it gives me a little bit of credibility with my my Princeton guys knowing that I did something uh, to get some attention as a ball player. That's fantastic. That's good hey, stuff, Scott, Scott, we, we appreciate the time. Thanks for the hey, uh, Scott, thanks as for we walk visit. off, maybe we'll show your walk-off home run. We have that queued up. We'll just say bye to you now, but we may not get to it. Thanks for the access uh, to the on. program. You gotta give me, you gotta give me that. And both you guys need to come down to our facility. We'll hook you up with some Princeton gear. That's what yeah. we're talking about. I, we've been getting a lot of swag on this. We'll tour. travel for gear. That's a mantra of mine. You got it. But book that for sure. Scott, continued success. Thanks for the visit. We appreciate you. Best to your family for the holidays. Thank you. My pleasure, guys.